Part one. You will hear a conversation between a librarian and student wishing to register with the library. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Hi, are you here for a library card? Yes, what do I need to do? I need to see proof of identity and proof of residence. You can use a driver's license, a passport, a utility contract with your name and address on, or a tenancy agreement. Do you have any of those with you today? I have my passport and a copy of my landlord's lease agreement. Will they do? Let me see. You need to fill out this form whilst I check your ID. It says here that I need a personal identification number to access my account. You can choose your own PIN. Make it a four-digit number, but not consecutive numbers like 1234, and you can't repeat a digit. I'd like to take out some books today. Will that be possible? Once I've given you a valid library card and your PIN's been accepted. Do I need to sign anywhere? Sign the bottom of the form and also the back of the card once I've finished with it. Have you included your email address? We need this to notify you on your reserves and overdue items. We also email a monthly newsletter that includes details of new titles. Can I access my account online? That's right. Just log in with your library card number, shown beneath the barcode, and enter your PIN. What happens if I lose my card? We'll cancel your old card and issue you with a replacement for a fee of $1. The first card is free. You'll also need a new PIN. We don't email it, so you'll have to come in so we can reset it. OK, thanks. Am I ready to start checking out materials now? Yes, you can access the library catalogue and your account right away. Here's a brochure telling you more about the library's lending policies and rules, as well as opening times, and there's information about late fees and lost items. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. OK, I'm ready to take out a few items, but can I go over a few things with you first, please? What would you like to know? Is there a limit on the number of items I can check out? You can have 50 items out at any one time, including a maximum of 10 DVDs and 5 CDs. Wow, that's quite a lot. What about how long I can take things out for? Books, for example. The loan period is three weeks for books, unless they're new titles, in which case it's two weeks. Magazines can be loaned for 10 days, DVDs for 7 days. And are CDs one week the same as DVDs? That's correct. What about renewals? How do I go about renewing items? You can renew items in several ways, either online by accessing your library account or in person. You can also use our automated telephone renewal service or you can call the checkout desk. And how many items can I renew? You can renew 10 items 4 days into their loan period. I'm going to be working on a research project. I might need to reserve items that are currently out on loan. How do I go about doing this? It's through your library account. We'll email you once the items are available. You then have five days to pick them up before they go back into general circulation. And can I just go on the computers when I come in or do I need to book a slot? Yes, I'm glad you asked me that. We have wireless laptops for in-library use that can be borrowed for up to one hour. It's first come, first served, so you cannot reserve these. Alternatively, you can bring in your own laptop and log into the library's homepage using your library card number and PIN. OK, that's great. Thanks for your help. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a passenger train announcement about how to board a train with a ticket. First, you have some time to look at questions. Good afternoon, rail passengers. The train arriving at Platform 4 is the Overnight Express to Telstar City. This is our high-speed, non-stop service with dining facilities and a sleeping car. The train will depart at 15.50 hours. All passengers, including children, are required to have a boarding pass before they can board the train. Please exchange your ticket for a boarding pass at the green booth near the main entrance. When you have obtained your boarding pass, you can access Platform 4 through Gate R. Passengers without tickets should obtain them from the manned ticket office at the Northgate entrance or use the self-service ticketing machines located throughout the main hall. Passengers who purchased their tickets online and printed off a barcoded boarding pass can access Platform 4 through Gate T, where their passes will be checked prior to boarding. Boarding will begin at approximately 15.05 hours. Please board the class of carriage shown on your boarding pass, either standard class or premium class. Your seat number is indicated on the pass. Reserved seats should be claimed at least 30 minutes before the train is due to depart. Reserved seats not claimed by 15.20 hours will be made available to other passengers. If you have reserved a place in the sleeping car, Please show your boarding pass to the attendant on the train, who will direct you to your sleeping compartment. Thank you. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to read questions. Welcome aboard the Overnight Express service to Telstar City. Meals are now being served on the train. Passengers travelling in standard class can have a light meal in the dining car, located in the middle of the train, or bring their food back to their seats. A limited selection of meals is available from around €5. Euros. Passengers travelling in premium class can have their complimentary three-course dinner and drinks served in the dining car or at their seat by the waiter. A full selection of meals is offered. This service is also available to sleeping class passengers. Passengers in the sleeping car have a five-star continental breakfast included in the price and they can purchase additional drinks and snacks from the attendant. Thank you. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear an interview with a soil scientist about home composting. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Good evening. Tonight we're taking a look at home composting and here to tell us all about it we have in the studio Dr Marianne Rottenberg 
a soil scientist from the Institute of Environmental Integrity. Good evening, Dr. Rotenberg. Good evening. Tell me, why is home composting such a hot topic at the moment? Well, we need to recycle more of our domestic waste because we are rapidly running out of landfill space. But primarily it's to cut down on harmful greenhouse gases emitted from landfill sites. Also, compost is the natural way to improve the fertility of the soil for people interested in growing their own food or organic gardening in general. Yes, I think most people understand the benefits of compost for the soil and also the landfill problem, but aren't greenhouse gases produced just the same when waste is left to decay in the garden? This is a common misconception. When waste is properly composted at home, it generates far less greenhouse gases than it would in a landfill site. There's also the vehicle pollution to consider when waste from millions of homes has to be transported to these sites. I realise that, but can you explain how home composting is preferable to decomposition in landfill? Well, composting is a biological process that requires favourable conditions for microorganisms, mostly bacteria, to survive and multiply. That means sufficient oxygen, moisture, warmth and the correct acidic base balance. It's also important to use the correct blend of organic materials and to agitate the compost to allow the air to circulate. This does not happen in landfill. Uh, yes, many people are unsure as to exactly what is meant by organic materials and what they can and cannot compost. Can you give examples, please? Well, organic means containing carbon, but in composting terms it refers to anything that was at one time living. It can be divided into green material and brown material. The greens are kitchen scraps such as vegetable, salad and fruit waste, old flowers and grass cuttings. These are a good nitrogen source. The browns include things like leaves, crushed eggshells, egg boxes, twigs and small branches, and shredded cardboard or paper, which provide the carbon. And do these brown and greens need to be mixed together? Normally it's more of a layering process. Each layer of greens, that's food waste, is covered by a layer of browns, for example leaves. Right, and are there any food substances that won't compost? Yes, most definitely. Don't add meat, fish, bones, dairy products or any kind of cooking oil because these are not very biodegradable and will slow the composting process down. Fine, I get the general idea. Thank you, that was most illuminating. Before you hear the rest of the interview, you have some time to read questions 26 to 30. One of our listeners would like to know more about the practical aspects of home composting. Can you say more about this, please? Yes, certainly. There's more than one method of composting, but a popular way is to use a ready-built wooden frame or a plastic composting bin, made from recycled plastic, of course. It can be sited anywhere in the garden or placed near to the house for convenience, if you wish. Ideally, it should have a trapdoor at the bottom to access the finished compost. The process takes about six to nine months. That's quite long, isn't it? Yes, yeah, so it's often a good idea to have two composters, with one full that can continue the process whilst you start the other bin. And the one thing, it's best to keep the kitchen scraps in a small plastic container with a sealed lid. An old ice cream carton is suitable. And how about the garden waste? Is that kept outside in another container? Yes, but it doesn't need to be a container with a lid. Nothing sophisticated. Any enclosure in the garden will do. Just somewhere to keep leaves, really. Start with a layer of these at the bottom, and then add a layer of kitchen scraps on a daily basis, topped off with another layer of leaves and twigs, and so on, in roughly equal measures. Now, I know some people have concerns about attracting rodents and family pets. Is this really a problem? 
Well, it can be, but it's less so if your bin has a lid or the kitchen scraps are well covered with leaves and twigs. And what if there are not enough leaves in your garden? Crunched up newspaper and shredded card can provide an alternative source of carbon, and they also increase the aeration of the compost. Well, thank you once again, Doctor. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear an undergraduate tutor talking about academic essays and referencing. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Good morning. I'm Dr. Mike Roberts, one of the Institute's undergraduate tutors. I'm going to talk briefly about the correct way to set out an academic essay and also how to reference it. More details on submitting your essay and how to reference academic work generally, including research papers, can be found in the College Handbook. That's the Red Book. You should all have a copy. These guidelines, or rules really, must be adhered to if you want to avoid losing marks. 5% of the total mark is available for correct referencing, which could mean the difference between a pass and a fail. OK, let's start with the page setup. The margins should be 1 inch, each side with 1 1⁄4 inches at the top and bottom. Now, these are automatically chosen to suit the printer, so there's no need to alter the normal template. The text must be double-spaced to enable the tutor to add comments either above or below the text and also to facilitate reading. Choose a 12-point Times New Roman font for your essay. It must be typed and justified. Nothing is to be handwritten, OK? Don't indent the paragraphs and don't add additional blank lines between the paragraphs. It makes the essay look longer than it really is, but this will not fool the examiner. Now, your essay will be marked and assessed anonymously to avoid any discrimination. So make sure your candidate number appears in the right-hand corner of every page in the top margin, the header. But your name must not appear anywhere on the final essay. Right, any questions so far? All this is in your handbook, by the way. I'll just mention the word count. To avoid being penalised, don't exceed the word count by more than 10%. So a 3,000-word essay shouldn't overrun by more than 300 words. Or, to put it another way, a 3,000-word essay should not be any longer than 3,300 words. If you write any more words than this, the examiner will not be obliged to read them. Don't write anything less than 3,000 words, though, OK? Right, I'd like to move on to referencing. Well, why do we need to do it? Does anybody know? Firstly, citing references in an essay lends support to your own idea and arguments it's important to substantiate them. Secondly, in academic research, correct referencing enables other researchers to locate the source of the material so that they can study it and check it. Finally, by acknowledging who wrote the work, you cannot be accused of taking another author's ideas as being your own, which is plagiarism. Now, some people might argue that there are no original ideas out there, that whatever you write, somebody else will already have written in which case you would end up having to reference all your written work. This is not true. You do not have to reference facts that are well established and in the public domain. So, for example, you can safely state that Sigmund Freud was the founder of psychiatry without having to reference it because it's a widely accepted fact. But what you cannot do is state that Freud was the first person to study the dreams of childhood without quoting the relevant text. OK, I hope I've made that clear enough. 
We use the Harvard system of referencing here. It's an author date system. So in the body of the essay, you would write in parenthesis the author's surname without the first name, followed by a comma, followed by the date of the source. For example, Freud was the first person to study childhood dreams, open brackets. Freud, comma, 1906, close brackets. OK? When compiling your reference list, it should be placed in alphabetical order with the author's surname, initial, followed by the year of publication in brackets, then the title, which should be underlined. And finally, the city where the book was published, along with the publisher's name. For example, Freud, S. 1920, A General Introduction to Psychoanalysis, New York, Bonnie, and Livewright. OK, that's it. Please refer to your Red Book for more details. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.